Praise the Lord, and uh, we are on part two of uh, Faith for the Rapture. And uh, as we look at uh, Faith for the Rapture this morning, we introduce uh, the area of uh, divine youthfulness. And uh, we look at Hebrews when Hebrew chapter 11, when Enoch was translated, that uh, translation is not just a gift from God, but it requires that uh, we grow in faith too. Same with the rapture. Although it seems to be a gift from God, and it's just uh, by the sovereign act of God, that's what most people think. Yet, it is required of the body of Christ to rise to the level of faith. And uh, that's why... We have this teaching on uh, faith for the rapture, and uh, it is not just for those who are to be raptured, but uh, for those genera first generation, it is also for divine health, divine youthfulness, and also um, when in these end times as we travel and send forth during uh, the super growth of the church from 2022 to 2027 onwards, that uh, People will be sent out two by two groups or, or, or witness groups all over the world uh, to preach the gospel, to evangelize, to do various things. And some of them will travel by conventional means, which is a regular natural way. Some will be traveling in the spirit, where they will be transported from one place to another. But to be transported in the spirit also requires faith. And uh, hopefully in this series, especially the second generation, third generation, and the first generation too, that this understanding of faith will be upon our lives, so that when God moves, that you will be able to flow with God and be transported from one place to another place. And we will have mastered the art of faith for transportation. And this faith is involved, and this is the faith process that we are talking about here. And uh, faith for the rapture is the same faith. And uh, faith for the rapture is a faith that takes us from this physical plane and uh, takes us into the heavens of God and permanently. And faith in transportation is similar in that uh, we are taken from one geographical place to another to push the world and then to return again. And I'm sure in Pastor David's vision when he see the end times, that there were some who were transported, some who were not. And those who are transported is also because their faith level has risen to that level. Their faith level has risen to that stage. And faith does not come overnight. You have to practice it in your own life. And uh, uh, so even though we talk at that level of faith, Remember that for years, uh, have not taken medicine, I'm counting in decades. And uh, then uh, uh, it's important uh, to understand that it has developed, it has grown, and to believe that God will heal in all situations. And uh, times of fighting simple things like cold, flu, and all those things. And we talk about in this morning how we need to change our concept and our thinking to have this level of faith. Uh, today, it's so easy for people to say, to believe and say, yeah, it's quite normal, you get a flu once in a while, you get sick once in a while. It's normal because we live in a world where everybody gets sick once in a while. Uh, at least not fatal sickness or diseases. Um, but they do. And sometimes they have statistics also. They will say, one in four have this sickness or this cancer. One in seven has this uh, diseases or cancer. Sometimes they increase it to certain sickness. And they say, a two out of three will get it. So when you hear all these people say, wow, one in four. One, two, three, four, one finish. Huh? One person is good. One in seven, one, two, three. They count, you know. But this is where your mind plays tricks on you and work against you of, because of fear. And you should have this attitude. When they say, one in three have it. Say, praise God, I'm among the two that never have. See, why should you think that you're among the one that have it? Can you see how the mind plays on you? And uh, one in seven has it. Some say, oh, finish lah. One, two, three, four, seven. Oh, finish lah, number seven. 
You don't have to be number seven. You could be number one to six. And so every time you hear this, it would be like uh, it works against people and statistic works against them. And statistic is not always true because statistic is not spread evenly. And among certain population groups, certain group, you know, they might actually be one in three. The other group could be one in ten. But you mix it together, it becomes uh, an average of one in seven or so. So, it's a... Uh, uh, statistics place tricks on people and out of fear of people they began uh, to absorb them but if you have this new type of thinking this new way to look at pain every time you look at statistics you say 9 out of every 10 it happened to them say praise God under one that is never happened and so your faith takes on a different way you look at the whole world and you can imagine that after Adam and Eve fell and then they multiply and there were a group of people and people like Enoch and all those of the eighth generation and they continue to grow. And can you imagine the first time someone has a flu? I mean surely the flu was there after the fall. And then everyone say, what's there? What's that nose running? What's this achoo achoo? No, what's there? Because nobody has ever had a flu before. Nobody has a cough, cold, nobody has a cough before. Because sicknesses were just beginning to happen to mankind. But we, after, after thousands of years down the road, it's so common. Then, uh, when someone says, I've not been sick for the past 21 years. Oh. But if you live during the early days before the fall, and they say, you know, uh, oh, remember they lived many hundreds of years. So some of them might have lived 667 years and then they go, Achoo! What's it? Huh? You're getting a cold for the first time. Hallelujah! 666 years with the divine help. <laughs> so you could imagine, it was a different world of thinking. So don't think it too strange that we have to renew this generation's thinking to a new concept to believe that you could live without sickness and disease. You could live free from all those things and live in divine health and go beyond it to divine youthfulness. Now, as we look at this concept of faith, we want to share it from the point of uh, 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 testimony and uh, show forth so because the concepts that we want to use. So, uh, can we have the chart on um, uh, the transportation a transportation that we all experience November 27 okay, so November 27 and uh, uh, three of us were driving down and it was a Tuesday 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 so it was a Tuesday and uh, uh, as we were driving down from uh, uh, Sydney uh, to Canberra, which is down here. So this is Canberra, and uh, towards the north uh, uh, eastern side is this highway called the Federal Highway. Over here, towards the uh, northwest, is a highway called the Baton Highway. And uh, you would take this road, uh, this is all the way, but Sydney is slightly up there, and you come downwards. Uh, south uh, west and as you travel here then this road straightens up and you take this road and this road continues on uh, to uh, down this road will go towards uh, down uh, and you this would be the road that this is one of the roads we can take to uh, uh, Melbourne and uh, you can also go to Melbourne of course by the sea, sea uh, next to the coast coastline and then we will go straight on uh, almost uh, 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 perpendicular, almost by the Stuart Highway, uh, which takes us to Adelaide, which is uh, 1,000 kilometers on this side. And so, as we were traveling, uh, three of us uh, were in a car. I was driving, Pastor David was sitting on my left, uh, Amy was sitting behind us. And as we were traveling, we had several time checks. Normally, the town that you will see when you drive from Sydney to Canberra is Goulburn. And that will be the last town you see uh, before the turning comes, that you turn left into Canberra. And before this town, 
you have about three uh, flyovers. You can't miss the three flyovers. And one of the flyovers leads into McDonald's over here. So somewhere as we near uh, towards uh, near near to it near towards the uh, Goban, and uh, both of them uh, wanted a toilet break, and I said, okay, let's take the McDonald's. And uh, so we're looking for McDonald's, and uh, so uh, as we travel uh, onwards, here, our last time check uh, was uh, possibly about eleven something, and eleven thirty, and. Uh, as we were uh, eleven thirty here, the last time check eleven thirty, and uh, then as we were traveling onwards, uh, we were talking about the things of God, talking about seven standards particularly, and we're talking about how holy the situation was, and how holy the atmosphere, and uh, how important it was that that it has to do not only with the planet Earth, it has to do with the renewal of the whole universe and a removal of sin from uh, the fallen universe since uh, Satan's fell. And uh, so our conversation was that, and we are talking about the holiness of God. And now when we were conversing, at point A here, uh, I knew all these points after we, we that happened, we went back and looked at the map, and I drew all these things. Uh, somewhere at point A here, we were physically transported into point B here. And I remember particularly this point B because uh, immediately after this point, I did felt something. Uh, within a minute or two was this turning that says Baton, uh, Baton Highway. But we were supposed to be here, somewhere here. So I said, well, Baton Highway, we haven't even reached gold, but Where's the, where's the, my mind says, where's the tree flyover? Where's the turning to McDonald's? And uh, so my mind was, uh, was thinking, because I've taken this route so many times. i traveled this route, by the way. I've driven from Canberra to Adelaide about three, four times. And over here, I lost count on the number of times, because Canberra and Sydney, just two and a half hours, and, uh, or three hours, we used to drive up and down. Uh, for some weekends, especially when we miss some of the Asian food, we will go all the way to Sydney. Live in Canberra uh, for about 13, 14 years. And uh, so, when we were here, I said, when we were transported here, I said, well, there is, uh, uh, you know, there's something changed here. And because uh, Pastor David was, uh, uh, also in, in the car and he was looking at all the uh, road signs and the road sign always tells you uh, the towns that are coming and the first town is on the top and the last town that they list there will be at the bottom. So he will be uh, probably looking at Goban and then it will say Canberra, yes, and uh, then you might have a good guy and all the other turnings to the various towns. And, uh, so for him, and, and then by the time here, I said back on highway, my spirit man says, turn here. Uh, but my mind says, I'm not there yet. And so I follow my mind. And uh, I went straight, past the turning. I said, this couldn't be the turning. We, we couldn't have reached this place. At that time, I didn't know the distance up here. Because we never take this road up here. And uh, so that was the... Uh, my mind continue, you know, saying, okay, we keep it. But the more I travel this route, I say, this is not the same road anymore. The scenery was different. And uh, particularly at a certain point. And Pastor David noticed the sign where he used to say, go burn, and then, uh, then you might have uh, a, a Canberra, then you would have a Gundagai, yes, and all the various things. And the so Gundagai is a third or fourth down the line. And then suddenly from here, is when the guy he said what happened to Canberra what happened to Goldberg they all just disappeared and you were looking at some of the signs here and uh, then of course uh, then I looked back at Amy and said okay, we were having some sort of discussion by that time and I said you know uh, I, think, I think I missed the McDonald's I don't know how I miss it but I think I miss it and uh, so we were slowly dawning on us that we have just been transported in a nanosecond. And uh, so while we were 
uh, uh, Isaiah right? I say, look, you know, I know this is definitely the route to Adelaide. The turning looks familiar. And uh, so, uh, Amy, I say, McDonald's further down the road. Keep going. <laughs> and, uh, so, and uh, also then he say, yes, I think there's a frame change. Because the board doesn't say Canberra anymore. Somehow we must have passed it. We don't know how. And uh, then we reach a place where I say, all right, uh, let the GPS decide whether we have actually uh, missed the turning. And so I was so confident. I say, okay, let me make a U-turn now because the next U-turn is very far ahead. And uh, so I make a U-turn across the road, uh, alongside the road, and turn on the GPS, and the GPS points Canberra this direction, which is this, and then turn down here. So I said, there you go, GPS cannot be wrong. And, uh, and uh, so then we realized we have indeed been transported. And then when we think back on that bad experience, uh, it all occurred in the less than a twinkling of an eye. In a nanosecond, we were transported. And uh, I remember clearly uh, the landing. Because I know something changed and then immediately there was a button highway on my left. And uh, that's why I can remember it's close to this side of the turning. And uh, then uh, when we look at the distance that had been transported, and my car, my car was set to... A cruise, hundred and the, on the highway we are like hundred and ten kilometers per hour. My car was set to hundred and eleven kilometers per hour. Yeah, that's one kilometer above. And uh, so our last time check was eleven thirty. And then by the time we were talking, talking, we didn't do any time time check. By the time we were uh, towards uh, uh, along here is one little town called Marambekman along the Baton Highway. When we were close to that, I said, hey, by the way, what's the time now? We realized the time was at point C here, 12.30 p.m. In the natural, there was no way you could travel from here all the way here and all the way down here and reach here at 12.30. In the natural, it would take you at least one extra hour. And so the distance that we were transported was roughly about 110 kilometers. And because uh, uh, at last time check here, 11.30, if it were 12.30, we would be somewhere here with another uh, 45 minutes when we reach Goban, reaching here nearly uh, about 1.30 uh, in Canberra. Because it takes three hours. Uh, roughly uh, to reach uh, from Sydney all the way to Canberra. But instead of being at this point at 12.30, we were at this point at 12.30. Uh, it was impossible physically. And uh, we were taken to, from point A to point B in less than a nanosecond. And uh, something has happened supernaturally. It was we transported and the side effect of that, after several weeks, Pastor David's hair in the front began to turn black. At first it started here. And if only this part black and all white, you would have looked like the, like the, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. same with, uh, with a black patch. Uh. Yeah. But even more interesting, uh, if, if they had just let you keep white hair, and have a black street all the way down. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's quite an animal that is as Eddie's favorite animal, right? <laughs> so they could have kept your hair streets of black and white. <laughs> but uh, slowly after several months, the back of his head is also turning black. Something with to be transported from point A to point B. We have to be physically uh, disappear from here and appear over here. And uh, uh, later that night, after we finished what we need to do in Canberra, we drove back to um, Sydney. And uh, then I had a look at the map. 
And then I started to figure out the measurements and how far we were transported. And uh, then uh, that night our speed still would continue to be taken up here to Canberra. And um, then um, uh, the angel began to explain to Pastor David how it happened, which was very interesting. And this was the explanation the angel gave to us. Now it relates to faith. Reality is made up of frames. Frames. Time is made up of frames. God lives in a timeless dimension. But reality is, our reality, this physical reality is made up of frames. And uh, just like when you uh, look at uh, a video or uh, a uh, 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 moving object, movies are actually moving at a frame now of 24 frames per second. And that's why it looks like it's moving, 24 frames per second. Except for The Hobbit, which uh, uh, Peter Jackson make it go 48 frames per second, double the speed. Uh, but the human eye cannot tell the difference. 24 frames per second is already quite, quite fast. And you can't see the frames passing through. And you just see it as one continuous movement. Uh, so reality is made out of frames. But more frames of 24 frames per second or, or, or 48 frames per second, more than tiny little bits of uh, picosecond frame and tiny little frames and uh, so what the angel of God angels of God did was they take a frame of reality from here and they join it to the frame over here so literally we were uh, as we as in reality as time progressed we were trapped we were moving to different frames and when we enter a frame from there, shoo, we were just there in a nanosecond. As we enter the frame, we were there, into that frame. So all these disappeared. We just went from here to here. It's just like a videotape. You cut, and then you join. And you just say, shoo, you just go to the next scene. And uh, so that was how the uh, angels explained uh, the, how it took place. And everything is made out of frame. This physical reality is made out of frames, so they can manipulate frames. And um, in our download on Adam and Eve, which we haven't preached much, Adam had the ability to travel to various places uh, by frames. And as he conceived the frame, he, uh, he was into that place. And um, the other thing the angels told us was, they choose a particular time to take us. And uh, of course, they choose the time uh, when there were no cars behind us or in front of us. And you can imagine that the car was following us. The shock might be too great to create another accident. Yeah. We don't want anyone to die. And uh, so, uh, also, you know, um, um, uh, it's, it's good. The road was, you know, empty, you know, back and front. And uh, so no car was probably uh, behind us looking at us and saying, hey, what happened to that car? <laughs> and uh, uh, or maybe they tried to overtake me, <laughs> or something like that. And uh, so that would be, uh, be interesting. Imagine if they were trying to overtake, they got halfway in our frame. Ah. <laughs> hey, hey, the front part gone. <laughs> and so it's interesting that how they chose uh, the, the timing and the frame and, but the other thing that they mentioned was when we were talking and discussing in the car we were talking passionately it says when our thoughts were at one when our thoughts were at one talking about the subject of God and His holiness and when we were talking about those things and our thinking was all at one shoo, we were into this spot it was like in the midst of a sentence. I remember we were talking about uh, the holiness of God. And I was so emphatic about God is holy. I was driving and my hand was moving this way. I remember that. I said, the holiness of God. God is very holy. You know, almost like pounding my steering wheel. <laughs> and so, it's holy. And after that, we were taken. And in the midst of the sentence. And hey, they said, hey, this part on highway. Spirit says turn, and uh, my mind continued. And uh, thank God that we were not 
And don't so blur that you continue driving all the way here. <laughs> the angels had to say, oh, we're gonna do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right. Not only take us by the turn us around, we go the other way. And then imagine they turn us around, we keep driving blur this way. <laughs> <laughs> really blur. <laughs> One day I got the real reverse. Really, and here you can operate blur like so tall. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we will be trying shung 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 So thankfully we got we caught it in time. And uh, they only they do it doing once. And uh, so we were all taken into that dimension. But to know that reality is made up of frames. And uh, I did mention with Pastor David that I've been meditating on that and there's a whole sermon on faith coming up from that. And this is the sermon. And this sermon is important. It talks about uh, reality and how, how faith can change and, uh, uh, our realities. And all reality, all that you experience is made up of frames. And uh, so with that, thank you very much. Uh, we will look into the Word. And uh, we close this now, and we look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and uh, to verse 3. It says here, faith is sub the, uh, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony, by faith we understand the worlds were, here's the word, framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen, everything that you can touch, feel, and see around you that looks real, is made up of things that are, uh, were not made up of things that are visible, implying they are made up of things which are in. So reality and all the atoms and molecules of all the 92 common earth elements we, all the common elements, uh, uranium is I think element number 92 and uh, it's atomic weight, uh, uranium 238 and the one that you can split is uranium 235 and uh, the artificially created uh, element is plutonium which is just after that Atomic weight 239. And all these molecules, elements, and things that are made up of, of uh, the physical reality by the law of physics and uh, chemicals, chemical reaction, and all those things around us are actually a physical reality like water that is contained by an invisible shape. And you could imagine that the present reality that we have is only like a okay we use this communion it is like water and the water in this glass is taking a shape because it is the shape of the glass if I had poured this water into a round uh, or rather a, a oval, sh oval shape a glass cup if the water would take that shape so water would take any shape that it is poured into it would take any shape with the exception that this water the temperature is lowered and it becomes ice where it can exist in its shape but even ice is shaped by the previous container that it was in before it became ice. And so nowadays you can have round ice cubes because you fill the uh, ice maker with, uh, you, you choose a round shaped ice maker. And they are cute, you can make your ice cube, they sell those containers that are in two halves. And, uh, then you could feel how, then you close it together and you uh, fill the rest with water to a little tiny hole. Then when it hardens, you open it and uh, it has a round, perfectly round ice. And, uh, but most ice is in square pieces because your container, before it became frozen ice, was in a square shape, or rectangular shape, or whatever shape you want it to be. 
In the same way, this reality is shaped by a container. That container in my spiritual world book, for lack of a better word, I call it the astral realm and the astral container. And uh, it's the shape that is there. And that contains and the physical uh, uh, dimensions will feel and take that shape. Might not be the best word for it, and that's why in my spiritual world book I call it the invisible dimension or the yetza dimension. Yetza using the Hebrew word for imagination. And uh, so that would be the, the, the Christian word that we use for that, the yetza dimension or the faith dimension. Chu Yongi calls it the fourth dimension. So you can see that Christians have been trying to describe that realm. The realm that is real but not seen yet. And it will exist as a frame and then that frame, reality fills the frame. And that frame must exist first before your reality enters into it. And so if you're praying uh, against sickness and disease, most likely the sickness and disease has been formed as a frame in you. Then you enter into the frame. That sickness and disease might have been a fear that came into your life. It could be, of course, physically caused to, and uh, by physical cause or spiritual cause or natural cause. Not all sicknesses are caused on spiritual side. But whatever is causes, whatever it is in fact, it is always a frame that is there. And somehow, when you enter into the frame, we Satan try to distort the frame. It's a, a frame of sickness, of poverty and all that. It tries to distort the frame. And uh, so that when we enter that frame, we are also distorted physically. And thus it is important to have the reality of our lives. And before your life chain, and faith is the process of forming the next frame in front of you. Faith is that process. See, while the world lives on uh, the concept of framing through the mind and making the next reality, like for example, before a piano exists in this shape, it must exist in someone's measurement, calculation, and drawing, and concept in the mind. You might put it on a piece of paper, draw it out, then you can construct it out. The blueprints must exist. This building that we live in, was once a blueprint on somebody's piece of paper. Before the blueprint, it was in somebody's uh, mind to design it. And from what I heard about the history of this whole area in Singapore, it used to be the first of your shopping centers, your main place, the Golden Mart, before Orchard Road and all the other places developed. Why? Because somebody conceived it. And today in Singapore, you're trying to build your, your main Singapore centre towards the marina side. The marina did not exist before. It exists in somebody's mind. It exists in somebody's concept. Then they create the reality and slowly are creating it after the image in their own mind. So even in the natural, we seek to change dimensions by frame. This is the natural law, and if there was uh, uh, something faulty in the frame, then the next frame is affected. We can say that all humans create their reality by frame. When a child goes to school, they have ambition. That ambition is a frame in their heart. And that desire in their heart is an ambition. And uh, then they create their ambition. Some of us are not so ambitious as a result. We are framed by other people around us. When you're not a strong person, others will make your life what you never thought your life could be. So other people are shaping your life. You go where the water flows, and uh, other people make the decision for you. Your own frame is weak. And uh, so some of us got very strong will, some not so strong will. But thank God, life is not made up of willpower. Because Behind it, it is also God supplying the real energy. And uh, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who, will, who enables you to will and to do. And when a person has a strong will, it's because they have a strong desire. When a person has a weak will, it's because they got a weak desire. 
It is not a question of willpower, a question of desire power. When you desire it more than anything. And then in, in that context, there is a natural dimension. Now in the natural world, even animals have that. Animals might not think rational thoughts the same way like us. Animals might not speak English like we speak. But they have their own language. They have their own reality. Animals, and you see in the book of Genesis, that uh, even a normal animal whose uh, normal genetics does not have, in Genesis 31, they do not have spotted and speckled. Inside each gene, do you know that inside every one of your genes is the basic genes for humans? That some programming inside your DNA make it such that cause the color of your skin to be what the color of your skin today. The color of your hair, the color of your eyes. All humans are the same, why were the color? But some sort of gene or genetic code is switched on or off. And among animals in Genesis chapter 31, even the animals who are pure white or pure brown or whatever that's not spotted and speckled in uh, chapter 31 it says here that Jacob has a dream in the dream he saw in verse uh, 8 the Lord speak to him uh, the speckled shall be your wages then all the frogs was speckled when Laban says the strict shall be your wages all the frogs was strict and the angel of the Lord says in verse 11 and 12, the angel of the Lord spoke to me in the dream, said, Jacob, I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap, leap on the flocks are strict, speckled, gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of battle. And so in a dream, he saw himself uh, and saw all these animals that were there. And he was telling the story of this dream. On the day he got out from the dream, God told him a method how to make more spotted, speckled, and strict animal. Because you know what Laban did to him? Laban removed all the genetically strict, spotted, and, and animals. Completely removed. He tried to trick him. He agreed to the wage. And he says, alright, I'll pay you all uh, in the animal and here in chapter 30 look at chapter 30 it says name your wages in verse 28 Jacob says you know how I have served you how uh, your livestock being with me I come with little and then in verse 31 what shall I give you and then in verse 32 Jacob says let me pass through all your flock today removing from there all the speckled spotted sheep all the brown ones among the lambs, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, these shall be my wages. There should be some, and that was agreed. But see how cunning he is. And Laban said, Laban said it was 34, Oh, that it were according to your word. In other words, agreed. And in verse 35, he secretly went through on that day, Without Jacob finding out, the male goats were speckled, spotted. Female goats were speckled, spotted. Everyone that had some white in it, all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them to his son, and he put them three days' journey away. That Jacob cannot reach them without violating his care for his animals. And when Jacob went in, there were no spotted speckles. He had just been cheated. I, somewhere inside all animals, the genes can be changed. And the angel must have taught Jacob, and that was when he had the dream, and say it was 37. Jacob did something strange. The Bible records it. He made himself rods of green poplar, of the almond and chestnut tree. By the way, chestnut tree outside very brown, but inside very white. And uh, few white strips in there, exposed the white which was in the rods. 
and the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutter, in the watering troughs where the flocks come to drink, so that they could conceive when they came to drink. So whenever the flocks are drinking, all animals need to drink water. So when they came to drink water, he would put them before that. So the animals see, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. Then when the animal conceiving, he would put black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. The animal all produced black, white, black, white, streaked, spotted, speckled. And it says here, the rods which he appealed, he did all these things in verse 39, the frogs conceived before the rods. Before the rods. And the frogs brought forth streaked, speckled, spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs, the frogs, and then when they were weak, he, he don't put it there. See, he was influencing the outcome. When they were weak, all the, all the good looked like, you know, walking halfway, almost fainted, things like that. He quickly take away all the things. Uh, then when they were strong, the bulls, he put that, black white, black white, black white, black white, black white, all came up, black white, black white. And the Bible tells us, in the end, all the weak ones were the ones without the spotted speckle. Oh, the strong one, oh, spotted speckle. And he did it continually. What is that talking to us? Reality can be change. And he was using the animals. He had to put it before the eyes. So the animals are saying, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, black, Imagine if some of you ladies are about to conceive or pregnant. Like what? That is the I, uh, so, can you imagine how much visualizing is that? There was all reality is framed from an invisible substance. With that, we look back at the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and it tells us here in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I think in this verse, only watchman me points out. I've read many authors, but not none of them point out. Only watchman me points out that the word substance is the word is a participle and not a noun. A participle is something we are ing. So, running is different from run. Because when you say run, it could be either I'm a, you're telling me to run, or you're talking about that you've run. Uh, yeah, it could be the race. But running is the process of running. When you say, I cook, Maggie me. Oh, no, Maggie me too easy, just outside there. I cook uh, sweet and sour chicken. Yeah, that's something different. And then you say, okay. So it could mean that you had cooked it, you had ate it, or, or, or something like that, and it's waiting. But when you say, I am cooking, it's different. The process not finished, correct? And uh, how many people? You know, go to somebody's house and say, I am cooking! Well, thank you, I'll start eating while you're cooking. <laughs> Never! We always wait till the person finish cooking, then you eat. And here, the word substance is not a noun. It's subs making it into substance, but there's no actual English word. Even the English word substantiating means something else. It means you have an argument, substantiate it with reason, logic, and points. But let's use it differently. And understand that the translation actually is saying, faith is the substantiating, the creating of a substance of things, not, of things hoped for. And it's the evidence of things not seen. So hope is without a frame. Hope is only a direction. But faith is a reality. 
even if you don't take it as a participle, and you leave it as it is, faith is a substance. There you go. And you don't talk about substance of faith yet, or substance of hope yet. But you leave it hanging. Faith is a substance. You know that faith is a spiritual substance. It's a substance that is invisible. But it is a substance. That is why in verse 3, that substance frame your reality. The word understand in the Greek word means more than understand. Uh, the word understand also implies experience. Uh, just like if you uh, if you watch the movie Avatar, the word I see and there is a, it's just a movie with a created movie language. The word I see in what is that blue color? Uh, eh? Navi. Oh, well, Navi, thank you. Can we remember the, the Navi? I see, I see you doesn't mean physically I see you alone. It means I know you for who you are. And that was a clever part in James Cameron created that movie to create a language that has these levels of that. Because in the Bible, in the King James, it says, And Adam knew Eve, and she gave birth. So the Adam knew Eve. Adam already knew Eve. He know, he know her name. But Adam had an experiential relationship with Eve. And he was a physical relationship. And they produced an offspring. So the word understand in verse uh, 3, although it's, uh, you know, it might be called a common word like uh, gnosis and, uh, and, and all that, uh, the root word of the word nous and nos has a word that, that implies experience. And look at what happened if I put the word experience inside. Because to understand is to experience, to them. That's why gnosis, or uh, knowledge, is important in the Greek concept. By faith, we experience that the worlds were free by the word of God. By faith, we experience the new reality. By faith, that reality has to be formed first and then you experience it. So faith is the process and the process is not finished. And many people say, if I see, I will believe it. But when you see, you don't need faith anymore. Because the ING is no need, no need anymore. If you, if you tell me that you, could, you can cook a nice Souffle. Why in the world is that? <laughs> and then, and uh, if you don't know the word, then you can cook it. But uh, then, obviously, I must say, are you sure you can do it? It's almost like, well, let's bring in something more real to you. If you tell me uh, uh, that you could, um, let's say, a very complicated dish. Um, okay, if you tell me that you could cook. It was that dish in Penang with the, with the fish tamak. Ah, if you tell me you can cook pulut ikan, which literally means fish tamak, Penang star, or asam laksa, then I might say, Are you sure? Because I might doubt your ability to cook. So you tell me you, you are cooking, and you say, Okay, let me see the result. And so the same way, when someone says, I believe this, I believe that. And it is still in the process. But when you say, I have cooked Pulalikan, Asan Laksa, here it is. Then it's ready for us to taste. Then by tasting it, we can immediately know whether you really know how to cook it. Especially if you tasted the real ones. You can compare. And 
In the same way, when you say, I will believe it, when I taste it, I see, I feel it, then you don't need faith anymore. But if you haven't cooked it and you told me you can cook it, if I supply you all the material, then I must have faith in you. Then you can process it. That all I have to supply you is the stomach of the fish and a particular fish. I think they take the ikan merah, right? Uh, the red fish must be particular one type of fish. They take the fish stomach and if you don't know to, how to cook it, it really stinks and smell it. And then you must put all the herbs inside. You must clean it well. Uh, it's a very nice dish. Uh, and uh, then uh, if you tell me, give me fish tamak, give me these herbs, one, two, three, four, five, and give me this and all the consistency. And then I say, okay, okay. And I give up to you. Then uh, suddenly up comes something that looks like a paste. I say, ah, failure. So all the ingredients wasted. So my faith in you was placed wrongly. And uh, you, you could not cook. So if you tell me something before I see it, then I need faith in your cooking ability. If you are cooked, I said, okay, no need, no, no need to talk about uh, your, your ability to cook, let me taste it now. And you say you produce it, let me taste it now. So faith in you is not needed because by the time I tasted your cooking, I will know whether you could cook that dish. Do I still need to say, I taste it, but I don't believe it. Say, so, yeah, baby, do you buy it for anyone? <laughs> right? But you can still have the process, but if let's say, you know, you, you, you actually did it, then it's obvious you don't need to have faith in the person. You know that the person can cook that particular dish. So the knowledge that person can cook is a different thing. Faith is the process before you get to taste it. Faith is the process that you need before you can actually enter the frame. The frame is still being formed. By faith, we understand. By faith, we experience the worlds that are framed by the Word of God. The substance that comes from God. See, all natural reality goes by their own frame. But you want to walk by faith which bypasses the natural realm, you need to create a frame. And faith creates the frame. And your belief system, and faith involves many things, the basics of faith. Faith believes, faith confesses, faith sees, faith acts. All these dimensions and the attributes of faith are involved. And faith, in the totality of it, faith frames the next reality. But sometimes what people think is faith is not faith. They mistake confidence for faith. They mistake mental ascent for faith. When it's, it has no impact on the spiritual reality. And the question we have for you today is, how do we make sure all these attributes of faith really is creating a frame out there? That when the frame is finished, then you enter the frame. Nobody lives in an incomplete apartment or house. Right? Some of you might have been in Singapore book your apartments, and I think here it takes you 2-3 years, correct? Before you get the one that you book for. So it doesn't mean that you, you got assign your HDB apartment and then you say, okay, oh, where do you go? Let's 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 go. You know, it's first it's only a piece of paper, it's a, a blank spot there. You can't you can't live there, you can't cook there. There's no water, no electricity. Neither can you eat and cook there, you know, while they are halfway building and then you bring in all your, your barang barang as we say, all your baggage and go, oh, and then the worker say, hey, what are you doing? It is my apartment. They, but they don't walls. We're still there, cement. Cement is still not dry. But it's my apartment. I want to live here. And there you are, is a building you're cooking. What? But there's no electricity. So you cook by your kerosene lamp or whatever. 
It's ridiculous. But that's how many people want. Before you form a frame for your perfect healing, you want to go in. Before you form a frame for your divine help, you want to go in. Before you form a frame of your prosperity, you say, God, why? Why? I pray for finances, it never come. No frame how to go in. The frames are not properly formed yet. There's so much doubt. And sometimes you know how people form their frame? And you see how sometimes buildings going up. But for many people, they put a few frames and uh, usually you have to lay the foundation. After laying the foundation, you will have to build the main load bearing system. And uh, whether it be prefabricated or whether you have to build it from scratch on the, on the spot, you have to build the load bearing places. Because without load bearing, you cannot build it upwards. And uh, also you need load bearing even if you go one story to carry the roof. And uh, so the load bearing system are the main things. So when everything has the structure, and the structure is basically the load bearing system, then you've got the feelers. You know, you build the walls and all those uh, stuff. And then, after, and then as you're building the wall, you also need to know the place where the, where the plumbing is, and the water, electricity, and now this internet. And, uh, and, and all these processes, where to put the electricity and the wiring, all these things as you, as you build up, you know, everything has to be coordinated. You cannot like, you know, you build a wall and say, oops, I forgot to put the plumbing in. Tear down the wall. <laughs> then you put the plumbing, put up the wall. <laughs> oops, I forgot to put the electrical system. Tear down the wall. <laughs> then you put the electrical system. Most of the time, a lot of people's faith has a lot of oops. And they hear something, they say, ah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. every time others say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they are not systematically believing in the things of God. Of course, some of us say, how do I know electrical nerve, wind system, right? It is the Holy Spirit. But all you have to do is keep focus and let the Holy Spirit build it frame by frame into that. But how do we make sure that the words we speak, the meditation of our heart, and our belief system, our visualizing, all these things are going somewhere and building correctly. And we're not constantly tearing them down, tearing down, building up, tearing down, building up, tearing down, building up, tearing down, building up, tearing down. And you will never achieve it. You go to any building project, you have one team building, another team tearing down. So you've got the demolition team and the building team working simultaneously. <laughs> You know what will happen? Nothing! One fine day they build up there, the next fine day they go, we say, oh God, the thing has been here. And you're constantly be doing that on your life. And you'll never have a place to live, to enter a reality of faith. Because there's, not in, there's inconsistency in what we believe. Now you notice something about Jacob and his animals. He didn't like put black and white blinkers in front of the animal's eye. Because then the animal cannot go and eat grass. Well, they eat grass also can blind as a bat. They might fall over the cliff. <laughs> and then they might fall in the pits and all this thing. But, you know, all this is black, black, but cannot see grass, cannot see human, cannot see anything. You need to put them constantly 24 hours. Because you know how human we do things, we do too extreme. No. He target when animals are very thirsty. Oh, all the energy. Water. And as they're drinking water, all the energy is there. <laughs> black man, black man. When the animals are mating, Jacob was a creep among them. <laughs> <laughs> so, what the male animal and female animal are doing their physical activity, he, and they are very busy, Jacob will put the black and white, <laughs> black, 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 So, all the animals say, what is this master doing? You know, disturbing them every time. Right? So, black, 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 because physical, uh, Sexual activity takes a lot of energy. And so, the animals are doing that, concentrating. Right, 
white, black, white. And in the animal kingdom, the sexual process is all their main process. The whole animal world works based on that. A lot of their, their instinct, a lot of different things. They have tested rats. Say, what? What? what tested? Okay, there was a scientific experiment on rats where they put electrodes into the rat's brain so that it stimulate the sexual pleasure in them. And so you, and every time the rat press the press the some sort of button or lever, they will get the pleasure. And you know what happened? The rats keep pressing, 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 and they die of starvation. They rather have pleasure than food. Who rats have They are humans who play computer games. <laughs> and at first, the foot had to be put under the dog. Then they press pause. <laughs> didn't brush it, didn't do, didn't bake, didn't do anything. And we have records of people die. Play computer game until they die. They got so much pleasure. They're like the rest. So apparently, the focus on pleasure is so great that people will give up food for that. And uh, then you have that uh, the animal kingdom. So what they're so concentrated, a lot of their energy in wealth, Jacob goes there. Then they are tired. Still black, white, black, white. To make sure that the main focus is black, white, black, white. And they give up choo, black, white, black, white. Not only that, when the animal has come to full term, as the mother is about to give birth, all the mother concentration is there. And the poor sheep, oh, 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 Jacob will crawl near there and go, the mother, oh, 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 black one, black one. And it looks easy for us, but it's really sweaty work for Jacob. He got himself really muddy all the time doing all this work. But he succeeded. All the animals that were spotted, speckled, stripped, all belonged to him. There need to be a period of concentration. And I mentioned I got one main point to share. And that is, in all the exercise of our faith, there has to be a unity of all of your being. Your spirit, your soul, your body. Now, your body is really very complicated. And scientists are discovering more and more things in their body. The, the things the body produce, uh, even in a relationship, they have oxytoxin, oxytocin and, and all these, uh, all these uh, endorphins and all the things are produced. And the body is a complex gland with chemicals in your bloodstream and then uh, some that produce uh, different reactions and uh, then the soul is already so complex and we probably don't understand everything within our soul and much more things of the spirit yet something must line all of their faith together and it's the synchrony of that, that desire into a desire that is in line with the will of God, then it's very powerful. And faith, as we are learning here, is a desire. But the word desire doesn't convey it. Faith is the passion that consumes your spirit, soul, and body. And we talk about faith for the rapture. But the desire for the rapture in the last generation is so great and it consumes them as they worship. And as they enter deeper and the desire for God, the desire to be one with God, the desire to be into God, is so that it consumes them. Rapture takes place. The frame, the desire that flows. Now some of us are so structured that when you want something, because of your training, perhaps 
eighty to ninety percent of your being concentrate on that. But some of us, the natural basis is fifty percent, and so that ability to believe, that passion that must be drawn out of each one of us, and so that's a basic here in Mark chapter eleven. And we're talking about the very rudimentary uh, things of faith that drives us in Mark chapter 11, the passage on faith. Before Jesus talked about believing in the words that you spoke, believing those things that you say, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. That is Mark 11 verse 22 to 24. Jesus said, have the faith of God. For assuredly I say to you, Whoever, say, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received them and you will have them. We talk about past, present, future. We talk on the basis of faith. We talk about believing in the spoken word. All those things we talk on the basis of faith. But notice, the whole root of this whole process begins with where Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask. Now, this is a New King James translation. The Old King James says, Whatever things you desire, you desire. It's more than the word us. It's a word that's, that, that, that talks about all the cons consuming of your desire towards an object that is in line with the word of God. Now, the devil will use that same desire or something outside the word to push you towards him. But God needs that passionate desire that draws us out. So my question is not what you're believing God for. It's how much you want it. Because how much you want it is going to affect the process of faith to create the frame. You see, does God want us to want it passionately? Yes. Does God want us to want it more than life itself? Yes. Does God want you to want it more than food itself? Yes. Does God want you to want it more than anything that you ever want? Yes. Then your faith will work. But God is patient. He draws the desire in our spiritual body slowly. Some of us takes time to build that passion and desire. And that is the process of faith in you forming and projecting into the frame. Somehow that, that divine harmony must come forth into each one of us. And we have words like this in the Bible where in Luke chapter 18 when he talk about prayer in verse 1 he says he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And of course, I'm sure he means prayer with faith. And his illustration was a woman against an unjust judge. The woman is so persistent, so consistent. Why? Because this woman wants justice above everything. Against an unjust judge. This woman was so persistent and she, she warned it because she wore down the judge. The judge was more afraid of the woman as he expresses it. He was more afraid of the woman than God or man. The judge says he, he doesn't fear God or man because he's a bad guy. But he feared the persistence of this woman. So the whole emphasis of this persistence of this, she want what she want. She will go to the judge's house, go to the judge's office, go to the judge's office. She's so persistent. 
That is so important to God. How important is what you're praying? What you're believing God, how important is it to you? How much do you desire? What do you desire? It needs to consume it into that. And let's point to Jesus and to see the whole better picture. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, this is said about our Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 5. There's one thing about our Lord Jesus, He is a passionate man. In uh, Hebrews chapter 5, it talks about what Jesus went through in verse 7. Who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplication, with vehement cries and tears to Him, was able to save Him from death, and was hurt because of His godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he says, which he suffered. Here's the thing about Jesus. He is son of God, son of man, perfect in every way. And don't you dare say Jesus didn't have faith. He had faith. But it's not just faith. You see passion here. Because our understanding of faith is mental assent. Yeah, 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 I believe, I got it, I receive. Then you don't understand faith. Faith, the faith of God consumes you. It consumes you. It must consume us. And one thing about Jesus, He has so much faith. Why must He cry? Why must He have so much tears? It says when he prayed, there was this passion that goes to God. He won whatever he prayed. And among the things, he give you just one tiny example in Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6. In verse 12. It came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And the next day he came down, called his twelve apostle. Why did Jesus need to pray all night? He didn't sleep. It was an important time. A selection process for the disciples. He already, by the word of knowledge, by the word of wisdom, knew who. He visited them apparently in a panorama, really knew where, he, where they were, who they were. Then why does he need to pray? Because the passion of faith must be projected into the frame. To form part of the frame. Somehow, faith must be Release into the next dimension. I believe Jesus prayed for the next level. The next change of his ministry. Because before that, he had a lot of people following him, but none chosen. Officially none yet. But there was a face shift. He was about to now choose the twelve man. According to what God wants, He already knew who they were. He already knew their makeup. Most pastors and most people say, Hey, I already know that. Have a good night's sleep. <laughs> Next day, choose that. Why did Jesus need to cry, pray all this thing? Why is this passion so important to God? Well, let's look at some of these mysteries. In the book of Psalm, chapter 56, verse 8. Psalm 56, verse 8. You numbered my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle, into your bottle. Are they not in your book? See, I didn't know God keeps tears in a bottle. The psalmist says, 
Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? We all know we have a predestination. Jesus knew he had predestination. Jesus knew everything he was about to do, everything that he should do. Why didn't he just carry them out like a robot? Go to the cross. Boom, boom. <laughs> Why did it all become robotic? Because that is the passion part that creates the reality. Faith must be driven by that desire that consumes your spirit, soul, and body. A lot of people, when they pray, they don't have that. Don't have that. You hear people's prayers, it doesn't come out that way. It's not an all-consuming thing yet. Now, they will have to work the process. God will keep working into their process until slowly the desires come. What are tears? Outside of crying, of tears forming because of chemical reactions or things that affect our eyes, genuine tears flow out when they affect you deeply. When you're very happy and it affects you deeply, sometimes you rejoice until tears fall. When you're very hurt, very sad, tears come from. And sometimes tears form and people cry even when their mind cannot comprehend it. It's something from deep within them. Are tears important to God? Tears and every teardrop is a symbol of something that consumes you. And if it is something good, fine. Something bad, then that thing can be destructive. But we know from God's perspective that He does. I mean, if He's so careful in a symbolic way to take the tears and put it in a bottle, not so much the physical tears, more the desires that were forming. See, the psalmist say in his wanderings, he's looking, looking for a way, God's will, God's desire, like God's perfect will. In his wanderings, he's crying for the right direction, the right place, crying until he found a way. God was taking all his desires to put them together. In the book of 2 Kings, in chapter 20, when Hezekiah was old and Isaiah told him through the word of the Lord in verse 1, Set your house in order or you shall die and not live. When Hezekiah heard the word of the Lord that he was about to die, he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray. How I walk before you in truth, with a loyal heart, and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly because he wanted more life. He meant what he prayed, crying to God. And while Isaiah was walking out halfway, the word of the Lord said to him, was five. Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of, your, of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. And then the rest, all the good news. I'll hear you, etc. But I'd like to emphasize the part. I have seen your tears. Right? Some of you say you like to be translated. How much do you desire it? Desire it passionately. There were some days when I prayed and I cried. Well, say, Lord, give me this one, this desire. This passion that must come. All your prayer requests in there. How much do you desire it? It's not whether you pray, not just whether you started the process of belief. Does it consume you? Does 
faith takes over. How much do you really want something? You see, why does God need us to want it that much? To separate those who are just one day as a hobby to those who really want it. And then He tests you, He proves you. When you pray for something, hey, why? You pray for prosperity, poverty came. God allow you to be tested. Why you test your motive? Test this. And then after the test you give up. Ah. You really test whether you want it the way the Lord's way. Prove you. And he said, It is coming. Boom, you lost some motive. It is still coming. Boom. And then there you are crying. Oh, it is the coming, Lord, I believe! Boom! Everything went out. You got thrown into court and bank and you're threatened with bankruptcy. The whole world fall apart. Because before that, you could do it in your own strength. Before that, when you pray, you thought you could half do and go do the other half. Partnership. I tell you, God's partnership is Him 100% V0%. And finally, you're left with nothing but your faith in God. All the world challenge you. Your other former business partners gave them, Oh, where is your God? And there they are prospering. And you're challenged with only one thing your faith in God. And then with every fiber of your being, you say, I still believe. I tell you, that cry goes all the way to heaven. God says, He's ready now. Finally, all the answer comes. How much we want it. It's very important to God. It doesn't necessarily all have to be tears. But tears are very symbolic. Or how much it affects us deeply. That we know in the book of uh, Acts, chapter 20, Paul talks about him serving God. And Paul was very passionate. And uh, he says it was 19, and also it was 31. Serving God with all humility, with many tears. And trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Many times Paul served until he cried and wept. Sometimes, you know, he worked so hard. But he continued working through difficult times. And it was 31. How long did he do it? Therefore, watch, remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He was in what he believed. He warned them three years. Passion comes out. And it's only passionate people that have the true faith of God. When you're passionate about the things God shows you, things you want. Of course, it builds up inside each one of us. It takes time. In the book of 2 Timothy, Paul who understood passion. He says of Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. You know how much passion needs to come from. Tears need to come. <coughs> passion. Because sometimes passion leads you into joy. Sometimes into tears. But there's this indefinable process of faith. And it's not just that I believe, I confess, I possess. 
X day becomes zero. Why didn't it work? The passion. Some people outwardly look like passion, but you look at it, it's self confident. Some people look like passion, but inside, all from their head knowledge. Because the human will and the human determination can also go quite far. But what God wants is the passion born of His Spirit because it is Jesus who ordered it in us. And this process of faith, this is the process of faith where the frame forms. I wanted, from the time I wrote down my 10 points, it's expanded to 14 points, in 1976, I determined these are the things that I would want to experience and have before I die. Because among them was to be translated like you know. But I said, these are things that I would want. And from 1976, I've been praying, and the day I got the answer to the translation of Enoch was actually 8th of August 2012 when, when we went to Mukabe. I knew that I need the touch of Enoch to transfer it. And that was the day I was laughing and laughing. But it was at the the accumulation of a great desire and this was the nature and it starts from small areas I remember when I was in a Baptist seminary I was in the second year I was still learning to believe God I knew, you read the Bible so you know people have faith and my favourite spot was actually the seaside and I used to go down we have a, our own private seaside in the Baptist seminary in Penang so we would cross the road, go down the hill, and I would sit there on one of the rocks and pray and meditate. So one day as I was praying and praying, the rain started coming. I said, God, Elijah, stop the rain. We can stop. So I prayed. Nothing happened. I got wet. <laughs> but when the rain was coming, I said, I'm going to believe I'm going to rain stop. And of course, in the end, if you stood on the rock long enough, <laughs> willing to get wet, wind and everything, rain should stop on. It's whether it stopped in a few hours or a few days. <laughs> I was determined I will not move from the rock until the rain stopped. Oh, it took a few hours. <laughs> Actually, my faith was not working. But my determination was working. I wanted to win. Wanted to win. Now, something about Pastor David and I, our characters are very different. But one thing common, we want to win. When we both play game, very dangerous. Everyone <laughs> casualty, collateral. <laughs> I know. So, this desire that when you want something, you put everything in down. And this Thing that I didn't have faith yet, but God was forming the desire for faith, the desire for those things. And perhaps the greatest lesson I learned was in the salvation of my father. When I went to the Baptist seminary, uh, I went by faith. I had a simple trust in God. Yes, God, tell me I will go. I didn't know where my support was coming from, but I believe that God will supply my needs. And so I went there, uh, you had your basic uh, necessities. And then I found that, as I believe God, my first month, I said, well, I don't know where money is going to come from. And we need to pay for our food there and all those things. And the first amount I ever had was a little money order in for hundred something dollars, hundred sixty dollars, something like that. And I uh, think food was about hundred dollars, so we got sixty dollars spare. And then you give here and that. And um, then I remember 
that it came from my father, who actually threatened to chase me out of the house and was not open to me serving God. And he didn't know God yet. He was still an unbeliever. Uh, and I, when I saw it, I said, God, uh, this cannot be. My father is sending me money. He doesn't even know you. And I'm serving you. He doesn't even know the God whom I serve. And I started praying for my father's salvation. I prayed the first year continually. Say, God, I claim Acts 16 31. I claim Acts 16 31. I believe in the scriptures. I said I believe. I thought I believed. And I really did believe. I consciously believed. But faith was a process. Then in my second year, I was still praying. I said, Lord, every time I see it, I pray. I pray. But something broke through. One day, when the postman came, I don't know why on that particular day. I remember uh, morning was uh, 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 the classes, then we have a lunch break for 12 or 1, and then sometimes we have a short break, then at, at, uh, we have a short lesson after lunch, after 2, and then choir was always 3 p.m. Remember that day, and I had choir practice that day, 3 p.m., choir music practice, and then uh, our, the choir was down in the middle part of the it was all built on the hill, middle part of the hill, and the dormitory was higher up. So I remember, and then the library was in the middle section as well. And so I got left back and I went back. I was walking towards the dormitory upwards and I saw my father's thing again. And said, when I saw it for that day, I don't know, it must be an accumulation of one year of prayer. Then they opened it, I started crying. I started crying. And I wanted my father to save so much. All the desires of wanting him to save came up. And it came up through my tears. I was crying and crying and weeping. And after a session of crying and weeping, and I went to my room, locked the room, and my uh, uh, roommate was not there, so I locked the room, praying, and I was crying for, I think, Quite long. I don't know, it could be an hour or two. I was not watching the time. And uh, so, I so cried. By the time I cried, finished, I said, Wow, well, almost time for the uh, quiet practice. And so I dried my tears. And as I was walking down, as I was walking down, it was like a burning sensation in my spirit, in my heart. And there was a joy that was forming. And it's almost like I hear the words, your father is safe. It's like finally I heard the answer to prayer. Not just in heaven, it was echoing in my spirit. And at that time, I knew that I knew that I knew my father is 100% going to be safe. He's safe. I don't know how to describe that experience. But that is part of the experience of faith. When you're believing God for something for so long, finally there's a, a time when, when it looks like, like when you start believing, let's assume like uh, all your, your spirit is in various things, in the, and, and then your soul is a, a thousand ways, your physical dimension is let's say a hundred ways. And the, as I believe, all the thousand part of my soul was getting in line over the one year. And all the hundred parts of my consciousness of my physical frame was also getting in line. It's like every time I pray, it was like it was like frame by frame it was forming. Forming. Until it reached a point on that day when it was a tidal wave of tears. Occasionally I cried, but I never cried like that for my father. And I wanted him to be safe. But not that much until I don't want to sleep, don't want to eat, don't want to have anything. <laughs> huh. He said, yeah, I want you to be safe. Nah, let's go for lunch. <laughs> but that day, it was like consumed until you cannot do anything, don't want to do anything. And it was a, it was a real faith moment. Uh, a pregnancy faith moment when he's giving birth. It's like the frame is formed and it was being birth. And the frame was being formed inside. It took time. Every one of those days was important before that. But it was like that day, it was formed and it was a birth. 
And as it came forth with great cries, and as I wiped my tears and walked towards uh, the, the music room, <coughs> I felt this joy. This bubbly joy that I cannot describe. It's not even in the rational thoughts. <coughs> it was just consuming. And as I walked down, I knew my father was safe. <coughs> After that, there was another six months or, or so, <coughs> six to nine months, I continued praying, but it was more like when I wanted to pray, it was like I knew this is answered. Some sort of knowledge like that. <coughs> and in that same year, we always have uh, <coughs> a choir tour at the end of the year, December holidays. As a choir, we would move to all the Baptist churches and sometimes other churches singing and presenting the gospel. Put <coughs> in the user as evangelistic campaign or whatever, some churches. And so we will have those things and we passed through my hometown, Jobaru, before we came to Singapore. So on that particular year in December, we passed through. My father, unknown to me, came and he was held in the Presbyterian church. And then we went on to Singapore to finish our tour. Then after that, we would, we would break up and have our holiday before we start school again the next semester. So when we finished the Singapore tour, we, I went back to my hometown for a break. And then I was in my home. And then my father told me, he visited that particular thing. And then he said the night that he visited me in the choir, he went back. And when he went to sleep, he had a dream. He dreamt that there was a huge cross full of light. And he was at the foot of the cross. And then he says, he was just marveling at this beautiful cross standing before him. And then as he shared that dream, he says, about six months or so ago, I was looking around and I saw this booklet you left behind, he says. And that bullet was by the campus crusade, four spiritual laws. And he described the way of salvation. And then he says, in the booklet at the back, there's a prayer. It's a sinner's prayer. Lord Jesus, and he said, I come into my heart. He says, I don't know how to pray, but I've been taking that booklet prayer. I've been praying that prayer six months before you came. So I say, Pa, I call him Pa, I say, Pa. That prayer is for Jesus to come into your heart. And Jesus has already come into your heart. Your prayer is answered. Your dream seals the deal that it has been done. And when I trace back to roughly the time when my father started praying that prayer, it was just at that time or sometime after I had a prayer breakthrough for my father. And so in describing this process, we answer the question, why tears? Why passion? Why Jesus must, must pray with tears when he knew the result? Jesus knew he was going to be raised from the dead. He knew. Yet he prayed until the blood sweat dropped tears. Uh, drop, uh, his tears dropped blood and his sweat dropped blood. Jesus knew, yet he had so much passion. Because faith Faith is the forming of the substance of the things of form. Sometimes in forming the substance, there is a great travail. It's like a pregnant woman. What happens with a fetus inside the womb? The fetus takes the nourishment from the mother. The fetus takes things. And the fetus and grows for nine months in a mother's womb. And sometimes if the mother don't eat enough, the fetus consumes some things from the mother. I think my wife lost one gigi. Huh? One or two. Two. Uh, two, two. Because she, she ate calcium, but apparently not enough calcium. 
So her tea grew weaker during the pregnancy period. And so I guess the body must have broke down the calcium to nourish the child. So two children, two two. <laughs> Why? Twenty children, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> not enough calcium. And uh, so, it takes something. Pregnancy and giving birth is a process. We all know that um, a child that comes out. Uh, too early, long ago they all died. Nowadays, we try to save the child with an incubator to duplicate the wound condition. But it's in danger of dying. So it must be fully formed before the child can come up and then be part of the world, correct? Before the child is hidden in the mother's womb. And all you see is the shape coming up of the mother. The same way, Faith is being shaped in your spiritual world. And it cannot be released out until it's fully formed. The frame is formed. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The creating in the substance, frame by frame, until it's fully formed. And then even when fully formed, it needs a birth process to come forth. And that is the structure of faith. And until we are so trained in that way, that when you pray and believe for something, you're like a bulldog. <coughs> until you're trained to believe God like that, your faith cannot work for the rapture or for translation or for transportation. Until we are trained that when you pray for something, you really believe. Chao Ji Fine in the second great awakening. And he is a man of faith. He says in his early days, and he was not from Bible school, he learned everything from scratch. But the one thing good, he was a lawyer. And so he had great intellect and he really studied and analyzed things. And he says in his book on prayer, prayer for revival, he wrote many books. He says when he attend church, this is his conclusion. And he attends church prayer meetings. Now remember, he was like the one man who created and birthed for a revival. The second great awakening was all mainly, he was the forefront leader. How could a man birth a whole revival? Think about the first great awakening. Society was at ease. But John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, or the people who were part of the Holy Club were the center of the first great awakening. But these people are passionate people. They get up at four in the morning and pray. In the Bible school training, they were no called the Holy Club. They were nobodies. They were just a group of hardworking students who were more prayerful than the others. But guess what? This is the group that turned the whole world upside down in their time or right side up and brought the first great awakening. You take away John Wesley, you take away Charles Wesley, take away George Whitfield, there will be no great, great awakening at all. The great awakening was birthed out of people of passion. From nothing, they moved something. Talk about overnight prayer in Singapore. When we came, there was no overnight prayer. Nobody was running. Maybe a few churches running once in a blue moon. But it's birth. We want to pray. And we want to gather people to pray. Birth from the desire. Birth from an organization. Birth from that we say every Friday all night prayer. But let's say if it didn't come, would overnight prayer have come? It could have come from one of you. Who said, I want to pray so much. Let me gather people who want to pray. Correct? It could have come from you. You didn't have to wait till I come. You know why? Nobody has enough passion to want to pray. So the only difference is passion. 
We want it so much. Now in Sydney, there are a few people who want all night prayer as they discover more, more things. But no more night prayer. Nobody has the passion to say, I will pray whether you come or not, come and join me. Correct? They don't need to wait till I go. You know why? Passion! People who are passionate and say, let's pray until revival comes. Correct. How long will all night prayer go on until Jesus comes? Now you know, until the first generation goes on. Let's still continue. Not only that, not only all night prayer not enough. We will one day have 24 hour prayer. We will one day have 24 Worship was very good. But not enough. We want 24 hour worship. When we have enough capacity and enough people to maintain those things. Passion. The future is birthed in our spirits and in our heart. Passion. And the same way we ask, new things can come out of your life. What has God spoken into your life? Are you passionate about it? Do you want it more than food? Do you want it more than life itself? There were many times that I came before God and I told God, Lord, I want this more than life. This cannot be. I don't want to exist. My existence is tied to what I desire and pray for. And then God really tied Your passion. And we must have this form. And this desire. As you desire something, Satan will challenge you. He will throw distractions. Remember when the word is sown, what did Jesus say happened? Satan. Like the crows try to eat a seed of the word. And then some fall on hard ground, cannot even uh, grow. The hot sun bake and all those things. They grow for some time and then the hot sun comes, they dry up. Not enough root, not deep enough. All these challenges. Some fall on ground full of thorns and distraction and things of this like distract them, cannot concentrate. And so they never bring fruit. It's important. That we have passion, we have desire in our life. And faith, there's only one point. The faith for the rapture. Faith for transport. And then when we have all our something happens to you. When you become in tune with your spirit, soul, and body, and you have a way in which you bring all your spirit, soul, and body together, there's a way now that your faith level is such that you know it can be done. Faith level is such that, uh, that, that today I, do, I, I, I sacrifice my umbrella. Why? Because I believe in stopping the rain. I don't simply play around stop rain, stop rain, stop rain. And I just also listen. There's also a way, not that you can do it, but I realize that you've got to tap into a dimension work with the angels in charge of the weather and then but your faith is such I believe any thunderstorm the moment you go pray and believe there were one or two times when a few strange things happened when they when I was with my wife when I was saying whenever she come out I said you have faith so when she travels alone she can carry umbrella when she's with me, say, no umbrellas allowed. Let's walk by faith. So far, it's always been there, but it's always... And you say, why want to do all this thing? Also, I, I believe in good medicine, in good doctors, in all those things, and people's growing level of faith. My own, my own daughter is a medical doctor. And one day, we will build a hospital also in... Australia, where we will have people minister to physically and spiritually. But I myself do not take medicine. I believe the word is my life. And so, but you have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And so some of you I tell you, I have a little headache, go back to the talk. Never even talk about praying. 
the little fruit, injection, please. Never even talk about praying. They want to cure cancer and pray for against cancer. These are all little lessons for your faith. When you believe, it must slowly consume. And the generation of the end times will be such that we are going to see creative miracles. Until golf cold, you know, you come near, disappear. Even the virus branch or dies. Until one day the atmosphere in the presence of God of faith is so much. Think about it. If one blind person sees today, it was it. Oh! But if every Sunday a blind person is healed, everyone comes expecting, ah, let's see which blind person gets healed. Then if every Sunday blind people see and, 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 and people are healed, we get used to it, correct? Every Sunday people will be going to see the hospital, anyone can come out and check up. <laughs> because we get used our mental men, mental being. Now I'm not saying that right now, the next Sunday suddenly there's a huge line. You know? As you flow and walk in the spirit. And as uh, and then one thing we learn, you cannot do anything without Jesus. It's not that you and I can't do it. Because it is Jesus in us. Then you realize that in some cases, you know, look at it and say, okay, this person's gonna die. There's nothing I can do. The spirit energy is dead. And, and then I discern God's will can't do. Even signs and wonders you flow with God. That's why in the Bible, when the lame man who was always there, he's always there, even in Jesus' time. And Peter walked by in Acts 3. He says, arms, arms. And Peter said, look on us. And Peter has to discern in the spirit. And when he discerned, that faith was all ready. Then he acted. You look at the story in the book of Acts chapter 14. When Paul was preaching, there was a person there who heard the word. And as he heard the word, he asked, see, when faith is full, faith needs to reach a certain uh, level. In Acts chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, this man, there was a man without strength in his feet, a cripple from his mother's womb, when he heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing he had faith to be healed. Now there was, there was a moment when he had faith to be healed and then another moment when he had actually healed. That is the next verse. He had faith to be healed but he was still sitting there crippled. He just needed one thing. The release. Now he had to be full. He had to have faith there first. And when the faith is there, Paul says, Stand up on your feet! And the man immediately was cured. Now if the command was given halfway in his faith, nothing would happen. The man might, uh, 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 and then one leg cured, one leg cured. <laughs> the man might have a little faith, and he got. Oh, it's okay, Paul. I'm better now. <laughs> I had to wait till his faith was complete. And then the command was given. So all this, God is already preparing faith. Can you imagine the second generation, third generation before the rapture? Do you think that there's anyone in the last day, the you know, worship service that we, we talk about, worshipping, preparing rapture, and some of them are all having cold, all wearing masks. Cannot even find sickness disease for the rapture. No, all of them in perfect health. In fact, by 2000 and around 2000 and uh, uh, 55 onwards around the 50s the church in the whole world were actually be there, coming to the glorious church we will again get back into the generation now when we preach on this we are not saying an overnight thing so that suddenly after this sermon you go up 
throw away all your medicine, throw away all your shoes, throw away all that, and then two weeks later we to bury you, conduct funeral services. Because <laughs> your faith was not right yet. You know? So we advocate that. But know that faith grows and in the end Paul called it the mystery of faith. How faith is working on our inside. The frame is being formed, really. Even the scientists can understand something about how a fetus is formed in the womb and how the fetus grows. But there's still parts of it that's mysterious. Because if you look at the fe fetus forming in the womb, how it grows from there, and then you can't see the eyes yet, then the eyes form, then the, the, the central usually is the, the backbone, the nervous system that is formed, and then slowly the organs are forming, then the, you see the heart really functioning, and then the limbs forming. It's a very mysterious process. But an important process of faith. And sometimes, not every woman who is pregnant has symptoms or body sickness. Some of them don't even know they are pregnant. What? Doctor said, what? Three months pregnant already? Because they didn't realize, they didn't have any discomfort. So in the same way, sometimes you don't feel your faith working, but it is working. It's freeing me on your inside. And then, more and more as your faith works, you begin to feel the pregnant lump. Then, towards eight, nine months, you definitely know when a woman is pregnant. Not only that, they also know. And, you know, they are also walking this way. And they definitely know because they cannot fit into their normal genes. So, definitely, you begin to feel faith process. At first, you cannot feel anything. But then there comes a time when it really is full in you. And it's ready. And it's perfect for The good thing is, faith is like a muscle. Once you grow those muscles, maintaining is easier than growing. And if you maintain your faith level, your faith works very easily at that level. But before you cannot lift 20 kilograms and you build a muscle to lift 20 kilograms and you maintain it, you can lift anything under 20 easily. The same way your faith muscle works, whether it be for finances, for healing, for health. Same way like until today, we, from 30 years ago, trying to pray about the rain and believe that. Uh, how, how the belief system conceived in me was one day I was watching movie about Jesus. You know, they make many movies about Jesus. And then in one of the show, they make Jesus movie. And then Jesus was teaching, it started to rain. And you know what the movie did? Jesus ran into the cave. <laughs> All the disciples also ran. They were watching the class saying, something is wrong here somewhere. <laughs> and uh, the rain coming, Jesus running. They said, even hey, me, isn't the son of God? Who walk on water? They said, hey, the movie is wrong. They should have made Jesus go. And then the rain stopped. Jesus slowly walked. Say, folks, the rain is needed for the other places. Let's go. And then they walk. As they walk casually, not purposely walk. <laughs> walk casually while he's teaching them. Then they reach the safety of the cave. Then the rain comes. <laughs> That would have shown his authority. Because he has authority over the wind. Remember his authority. A lot of the miracles are by accident. Quote unquote. In other words, they were not planned miracles. They come out of daily life. Come out of daily life. And the daily occurrences. And then they're in the boat. And the boat was stormy. Then Jesus was sound asleep. And then you know, they all say, they all were taking water out of the ship, out of the boat. And then one of them suggested, we are all dying. And then the other said, yes, the master doesn't care for us. So combined, they wake up Jesus. Master, master, don't you care that we perish? That's what exactly what they said. Not a concern that if they perish, he would also have perished. What do you think? When the boat sink, they all sing, Jesus remained floating on that the most thing he would have sung too. Don't you care 
that we perish? The first words of Jesus is, Oh, you of little faith! Wow, can I scold it? And Jesus turned to the storm. Peace, be still! The Bible didn't record it. But probably Jesus went back to sleep. Ah. But the Bible didn't record that. You know, they were suddenly at the place. Quite supernatural. Shoom, they were taken to where they were supposed to go. That's Jesus. It was not a planned encounter to stop the weather. He expected the disciples had more authority. So that one day, when he was talking on the board, he says, Beware of the Pharisees, leave of the Pharisees. Then the disciples, they go and say, Is he talking about bread? What? Beware of the living of the Pharisees. As if Jesus was telling them, don't go and visit the bakery that belongs to the Pharisees. Don't use their living. Don't buy living from them for your bread. What? Really blur like so talk. And they were discussing. Did we have enough bread? Is he talking about bread? Jesus had to scold them again. Jesus says, you know, when there were 5,000 and uh, how many, and uh, there were five loaves, uh, two fishes, how many were left? And they said, how many, how many? Then when they were the 4,000, how many loaves there? Yes. They said, don't you have any faith? And don't worry about having enough bread. They were discussing, what, got enough bread or not? You buy bread from Pharisees, throw it away. What, what, got enough bread or not? What? He was not concerned of the bread. He implied that if there was a third occasion that they need to multiply bread, he would have easily done it. And every miracle was he come across them. It was not a planned miracle. So do you think that when you face your cold, your flu, your accidental sickness, your situation, is waiting for you. Oh, oh. It was waiting for your faith. It was waiting for your faith. Your faith to rise in small, small ways. Your faith to be trained. And then you grow to have faith in God. Now, I don't mean that when you have faith, then we all be playing with the weather. Rain, 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 rain. What? God won't permit that. See, what happened if two believers believe God very strongly? One believe for rain, one didn't believe for rain. One asks to stop rain, one start to rain. Then both are neighbors. <laughs> if hypothetically there was such a situation, and hypothetically really two fellow really got great faith. The rain will be exactly on the borderline. <laughs> one side rain, one side no rain. That's your answer. So it's important for us to trust in God, to believe in God, to have our faith increase in every arena. Firstly, in the things that you have desired in God. Look at the list that you have listed. There, prayer. How much do you want? How much? And then, look at what you are praying, all this. Continue your prayer. Some of you already have formed some things in your, in your spirit. Being. You know, in your spirit, in the being of your spirit. You already formed something. Continue. Because there are more things to be added until it's fully formed. Remember, until the frame is formed, you cannot actually move into the frame. You must finish building the boat before you can use the boat, correct? And so at first, you're carrying the wood that make the boat. But after some time, the boat carries you. So before your faith can carry you, you must carry the faith. And once the faith is full and you form a frame, then you will be taken into the frame. Your life will change. 
all things are possible to those who believe. Whatever financial situation you are in, if you walk in God's perfect will, the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. The Lord will take care of you. Whatever situation, whatever ailment or sickness and disease that you have, if it so be that it's not your time to go home yet, then healing is possible for you. All things are possible to those who believe. Just ask yourself the question, if Jesus were here, what would he do? And if the answer is yes, you will be totally healed, then let your faith be so. Because it's your faith that brings the reality of Jesus into your home. And such will be our faith. Such will be our faith. Remember Kenneth Hagin. After meditating so long, and then the little voice says, If you believe you are healed, because you keep confessing you've been healed, even though without any healing, the little voice says, If you are healed, you should not be in pain. Then he said, I agree with that. And then he pulled himself out of the bed. I tell you, he was in pain. In the morning. After 86 years, correct? Without sickness, without any ailment, he lived. Boy who pulled himself out of pain. Our faith must carry us, pull us through in every situation. So you will have opportunity to exercise your faith. Faith grows like a muscle. You slowly exercise and your muscle grows. Faith is like a muscle. As you develop it, then you learn to maintain it. It will always be there for you. You can use it. Let's pray. Father, we pray that this passion of faith, this understanding of this desire and passion of faith will grow in our life. Because when we pray and believe God for things, sometimes our passion is not there. Sometimes we half believe. Sometimes we believe, but we don't really want it that much. In our heart, there is a necessary necessity to surrender all things. Yet at the same time, there is an understanding that when something is in your will for our life, we must never let it go. We must hold on for dear life. In fact, all dear life rests upon that. Thank you, Father that you stir our faith and passion to believe you and to really, really, really believe in those things we pray for without any shadow of a doubt. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together. And, uh, God's loving kindness is better than life because His loving kindness is from faith and loving kindness is experienced before reality, a true reality of life. What is better than life? Faith. Because faith forms life. Thy loving kindness is
lie. Thy word is better than lie. Thy faith is better than lie. Because this life is molded according to your word. This life can be easily molded. No matter how structured, how fixed, how permanent it looks. Everything around us, whether it be mountains, hills, trees, all buildings and everything, is subject to your faith and your power of your word. And Jesus, you did say, when you look upon the mountain, and at that time you were walking by the Mount of Olives, and you say that if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can command the mountain to move from here to there and it will move. Because all things are possible to those who believe. Father, open each eyes. Open our eyes to see the power of faith. Because the concept of faith that many of us have is a faith reduced to a small tiny area of our Christian life. We have no idea that faith actually controls this life. And this life doesn't control us. But faith can change all that is around us if only we have faith. Thank you, Father. Release the measure of faith into our lives. Increase the measure of faith. Alter this faith of God into us so that we know that all life around us is controlled by the faith that comes from the Word of God. Everything, heaven and earth itself will pass away because they are only simple clay play dough in the arms and hands of faith. But your Word will not pass away because your Word contains faith. Faith that changes the universe. Thank you, Father. Release us into the great faith of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap. Amen.